freaks, Paul Markle with Student of the Gun, and on the couch with me is Josh, martial artist, savage gentleman, monster among men, Matt, bass player extraordinaire, Matt Dorito, and uh, we're going to be chatting and talking. One thing I want to make sure that my audience is aware of, and we've talked about this, but I want to make sure that everybody knows. In addition to being a rock star and a gun guy and a cigar aficionado, mm -hmm. Matt is also a, an entrepreneur and a philanthropist, and he has an organization called Star Treatments that you need to know about and you need to pay attention to. Star Treatments was an idea that, uh, that I came up with years ago and uh, actually finally put in motion about four, four and a half years ago. And I watched a family that was close to us go through having a child with cancer and, and go through the treatments from like day one of diagnosis through, you know, like cancer free and, and beyond. And I noticed a lot of things with how they handled, you know, going through appointments and checkups and things like that and, and even the downtime. Like they, they kept their daughter really, really busy, uh, always, you know, brought her out to concerts and fairs and different things like that, stuff to keep a smile on her face and almost to keep her so busy that she didn't realize she was sick, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Um, so I saw the way that like having positive experiences could really influence a child's wellness for the better, you know? Um, having that positive mindset of like, okay, you know, like I'm sick and I'm more sick than most kids, but I'll get better and, you know, I'm having a good time now and not thinking about being sick. Uh, so along with that, I also saw some of the struggles that they had were things, things that insurance wouldn't cover or if they did cover or reimburse you, it wasn't for, you know, 10 months down the road. And I realized how a family that is living paycheck to paycheck can quickly go bankrupt. Like the, the numbers are astronomical. I think it's like more than 80% of families that have a, a child diagnosed with, with uh, cancer, leukemia, any kind of like serious illness like that end up filing for bankruptcy. Wow. Um, so, you know, there are a lot of out-of-pocket expenses, one of them being travel, and that's where we kind of step in. Um, there are 12, really about 12 major children's hospitals all throughout the United States. So when you look at that, the Continental 48 divided by 12, like the chances aren't great that you live super close mm -hmm. to one of those major children's, children's hospitals, yeah. you know? And, you know, when you want your kid to have the best care, that's where you go. So what I was noticing is a lot of families travel like four or five hours in one direction just to get to a treatment. And they might have to do that once a month, once every two weeks, mm -hmm. could be multiple times in a week. So uh, you've got families that may not have reliable transportation. They've got to pay for gas money. They have to take time off of work. They're losing money. They're losing jobs. Uh, and so what Star Treatments does is we provide those families with transportation and we try to set them up with VIP transportation. So either tour buses like the ones we travel in or, you know, party vans, limos, any kind of like <clears throat> awesome, cool VIP yeah. experience. And, you know, we'll include, we'll figure out what the kid's into and, you know, set them up with snacks and drinks. And, you know, if they're into a certain football team or a certain band, we'll get them, you know, like try to oh, wow. source down some some sign stuff or whatever it is to throw in there too. And uh, what happens is you take the scariest part about, you know, what that kid is going through, which is, you know, like if, if you have to sit in the backseat of a car for five hours, going to a hospital, and you know, you're think about get, nothing, but I got to get cancer and treatment. by yeah. doctors and nurses. And now you're in like a cool party bus or something like that. And you've got video games and you've got movies, you got snacks and, you know, you know, maybe some of your friends want to join along. Um, you're not thinking about what you're going there sure, for. Sure. And in the same regard, when you're done with your treatment and you're feeling sick and you know, you're exhausted, uh, it gives you a comfortable means to be able to like go lay down in the back of the vehicle and have your mom and dad actually take care of you mm -hmm. rather than being stuck. Pile in the car and in the back of the car with your brother and sister yeah. driving back. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. yeah. So um, it, it hits on a few different levels, but uh, you know, mainly our, our goal is to keep kids in a positive mindset as they're going through a traumatic experience and, uh, and also to help the families financially. Uh, there's one family in particular, right, where the kid that we're helping for the past nine years, uh, his, his condition has led him to have to go I think it's like 77 miles or something like that 
one way to a hospital, which isn't a terrible amount, but he has to go every other day or every single day down there to the hospital and back. Uh, and that's been his, his routine for nine years. Jeez. So we stepped in when we helped this family out and we take him, we sent him out on every single ride. And what was happening was his, uh, his mother doesn't drive. His dad will drive, but had, had been through numerous jobs, right? Couldn't hold a job because right. the schedule wouldn't allow for him. Mm-hmm. Um, and then he, you know, he's burning the candle at both ends. He would take, you know, night shifts and then wake up and then have to, you know, take his kid and then come back and he just couldn't make it work. So they had bought like two or three brand new cars and drove them completely in, in the ground, just putting miles on mm-hmm. them. Um, the cost of fuel, all this, all this stuff adds up. So when we send him out with a professional driver, like even if his dad wants to go with him, they can sleep on the way down, you know, or if his mom wants to go, but she can't drive. She just has to jump in and chaperone. That's it. Or it opens up the door for, you know, if mom and dad are both working, grandma and grandpa might not drive, mm-hmm. but they can jump in and yeah. and chaperone this kid, you know, to, to the treatments and back. Just opens up a lot of options for them, it seems. Right, yeah. So, you know, we have families like that, too, that have a very rigorous schedule where they're not going real far. Mm-hmm. You know, it might take a, you know hour, hour and a half to get there and back. Um, but it takes such a toll on the family. We're just able to help relieve them of that burden. Relieve some of the pressure, basically. Yeah. Using <clears throat> your, a relief valve, man, to relieve these guys. Right. Not only financially, but logistically. For yeah, them. And emotionally. And emo- yeah, and, that, and I think, like you were saying, that's, that's a big part, right? Where if you, can, if you can just do a little bit to lift their spirits, you know what I mean? Like that, that's going to make huge strides, hopefully, overall in their treatment. So well, absolutely. And I've seen some of the after actions really? where they have the kids and... And, and you know, like the, the the kids are just talking, talking, talking about all the time they spend on the bus. And what weren't they talking about? The actual treatment, treatment yeah. Right? Yeah, exactly. they weren't talking about I got to go to cancer treatment. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They're talking about being on a rock and roll, you know, tour bus. Yeah, yeah. You know, and how cool that is. It's about having that positive mindset and being able to, you know, keep them in a positive mindset. I feel like their chances of beating whatever it is they're up against, whether it's cancer or you know an autoimmune disease or anything else down the line, uh, it just makes it that much better. It's so the most important one thing, thing out of the for you know. people who are over there on the other side is they're like, okay, I'm convinced. Where I do we go? You. Where do we go? Startreatments.org. Startreatments.org. And there's also a there's a charity hack. Alright, all you freaks out there use Amazon. You know you do. Don't say you don't. Go to smile.amazon.com and if you haven't right. done it yet, you can choose a charity. There's hundreds and hundreds of charities. And you can pick Star Treatments as your official charity, and every time you make a purchase through Amazon, using Smile on Amazon, they will make a donation. And it doesn't cost you one extra penny right. out of your own pocket. That's right. You're so paying just, the same thing you normally would. You're paying would. the same thing you normally would, only Amazon is going to cut a check to these guys uh, just for you shopping there. Nice. So I know you guys are shopping on Amazon. Just set your browser at smile.amazon.com, choose Star Treatments. And easy peasy. Damn, yeah, easy, very cool. Easy day. So that, that kind of touches on a little bit of the gentleman side. Obviously, as a musician, you know, that's very gentlemanly. You know, to there's a lot of skill to go into learning music and, and, you know, perfecting that craft. But with Student of the Gun here, let's talk a little bit more of your savage side. Sure. If we can. So you're you're pretty big into firearms. Yeah, absolutely. From what I hear. Yeah, big 2A supporter. Nice. Um, get out, train, practice as much as I can. Uh, I even integrate that with with the charity that we were just talking about. So one of the things that I do on the road when we have a headline tour is I'll go out during the day before the show and I set up meet and greets in, in every city. Mm-hmm. So if someone wants to come meet me at a local gun range, we can shoot together one-on-one if they make a donation to my charity. Nice. Man, that's so, that's pretty cool. That's so uh, you want to shoot with a rock star, pony up for the charity. That's a win-win, win, though. That's it a win-win win because... No, man. I mean... In order to go, just just to hang out. I mean, people stand in line to meet to meet guys like you all the time, and they're paying. You know, who knows how much to either get in that line or get the autograph or whatever. Yeah, that's pretty simple. Like, hey man, go shoot some guns, hang out, and, help and some help some kids out. And we we do that too. You know, the band does. We do our own VIP meet and greets where you meet the whole band and everything. And this is just something I do on my own. Um, 
but you know it's most of it's taken care of so we we're lucky enough to have sponsors and, and I work with some great companies like I work with Cabot Guns so mm -hmm. I've got really nice pristine uh, you know 1911s to bring out for guys that are into that and, nice. and uh, people can get their hands on those. If you're into 1911s you mean? Uh, yeah. You, all right, all right. So on Savage Gentlemen a lot of times we give kind of pick one type thing, right? So one of those is typically Glock 1911 because that's always the huge debate and I'm sure you guys freaking bang your head against the wall people yeah. losing their mind. Um, so I'm, we're going to put you on the spot. I'm both. There you um, go. See, you don't have to choose. You don't, you don't have, have to choose. To choose. Yeah. And, and here's the thing. So uh, look at at Cabot, and I'm I'm singling them out because they do everything a little different than today's uh, production 1911s, right? So everything's done in house. We make nice. all of our parts. Everything is um, wire EDM or CNC cut from solid steel, uh, billet steel. So um, it allows us to control all of our tolerances in house. Like there are a lot of guys that'll get you know like forged frames or things like that, like from other companies and they bring them in and they'll put their parts on it, put their mm -hmm. stamp on it, um, make it their own. But I mean, <clears throat> we smith every barrel that goes on our 1911s. Um, like, you know, from our, our super ultra premium custom guns all the way down to our, our dealer guns, every single barrel is smithed. Um, there are a lot of things that we do and that we've paid close attention to in the 1911 community mm -hmm. uh, to you know, alleviate some of the common problems that yeah. you have with it. Uh, the breech face actually comes back the same distance on our commander as it does on our full size. Oh wow! Which okay. usually you get a, a shortened cycle length when you go to a shorter gun, and we've actually fixed that to where, <coughs> like, the timing of the gun doesn't change, and that's where I think a, a lot of the issues come. The from. smaller the 1911, the more problematic it's going to be. It has to do the as, same as, amount as of work make it and small, a smaller it's like every amount gun. of time. Sure. Every gun, as you make it smaller, it was like, I want it smaller so it's more compact. And every time you make it smaller, <coughs> you're sacrificing your, your issues. Yeah, there's a trade your Issues increase. Barrel length shortens, your accuracy is down, mm -hmm. there's less gun to hold on to, you have, you know, your capacity. Less and more. Like, yeah. Yeah. Um, so I do encourage people to carry full size. But uh, that's go. getting a little off the topic. Um, I love 1911s. Uh, I do carry them. I also do carry Block 19. So there you go. I also carry Smith and Wesson <laughs> and MP. So equal you know opportunity. What I mean? You know, like uh, why choose? It just depends. Like there are a lot of varying factors yeah. of why I carry and when. Um, and there are very few. I'll, I will tell you this: a Block 19 out of the box, <clears throat> I will trust my life mm -hmm. with that. And there are very few 1911s that I would trust my life with. Out of a box. Out of a box, certainly. Well, I don't know. How old are you, man? 33. 33. And you are? 32. 32. Okay, I'm 51. Here's the way it used to be. Let me school you guys. <laughs> uh, please, back please. in the 70s and 80s, <clears throat> nobody bought 1911s out of a box and used them. Really? And they knew that. Really? No, what you, you do is you would order a 1911. And you would get it, sign for it, and send it immediately in the box directly to a pistol smith to make it run right. Huh, That's no what you kidding. did. That's just what was the expected. Operation. That's just wow. what it was expected of you. And, and in the United States of America, there were dozens, if not hundreds, of 1911 smiths because nobody shot stock 1911s except for the, the World War II trade in ones, you know, the old ones. But you would buy it, and it wasn't. You're like, well, of course it doesn't. It hasn't been smithed yet. <laughs> you know, well, you have to send it, you know, yeah. to Omar Svensson <clears throat> or Bill Wilson or or whomever. You, that's what you have to do. You buy it, and then you send it directly to a pistol smith, and then he charges you five hundred dollars to make it run, and then he sends it back to you, and now you're happy, and you're good to go. Yeah. And, and that was just the way it was, huh. and especially with like uh, hollow point ammunition. You know, if you could get a pistol that would cycle, reliably <clears throat> cycle hollow point, man, that was that was a big deal. Right? You hear the old, a lot of the old guys like, oh, I just run hardball because that's all you can rely on. Well, with a Glock, a Glock will chamber empty cases. Mm -hmm. Okay? So, I mean, it's, we're so spoiled today by guns that work well. You are so <laughs> spoiled today by guns that work well. 
Uh, you don't even know. But that's like buying a car and like, well, I'm not going to drive it. I've got to take it to the guy I'm gonna take it directly and have to him the, tune to it the for guy. me. He's going to fix it up. For yeah, me so it's like, well, but yeah, no, that's crazy. that's the, really the way it used to be. Man. It, it used to be that way. And, and then when when Glock came along, they're like, no, just like right. take it out of the box and load it and go shoot it. <laughs> It'll work all the time. The AK of pistols. Yeah. Ah. The AK. So. You're uh, any any so <clears throat> the uh, the other side of Savage Gentleman, the other arm is Ready Man. Um, which you saw, we, we kind of gave the tour. So Jeff Kirkham is is the head honcho of that, and Savage Gentleman himself, but he is like the grand pooba of AK-47s. Like the guy freaking loves them like they're going out of style. Like that is his I, number one firearm of choice, hands down, every time. Yeah, I, I can get down with that. You're about that life? Yeah, I, yeah. they're like the ugly duckling <laughs> to me. Man, I... I There's, the uglier, the better, dude. <laughs> I love them, love them. I, I don't, I don't hate them, but it, but like when you're when you're you for me just shooting a more conventional rifle, like there's so many little nuances that I just haven't developed the coordination. You know what I mean? Everything's on the wrong side, and it's like, ugh. No, and so it's with, on the right side. You with said with, with, with time and practice, me, like right anything. Side. Yeah, and, and 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 Jeff is slowly making a believer out of me. Like the more I handle it, the more I'm like, all right. All right, these these crazy Russians might have been onto something, but yeah, definitely. You know, and this kind of translates back to what we were talking about with 1911s versus blocks. Uh, I got so spoiled by shooting 1911s and things like that first, mm -hmm. like my first in introduction to firearms. I was, you know, well, my first gun ever was bred a 92 FS. But um, aside from that, I jumped into the 1911 world and then have worked backwards towards Glock. When I wish. Now looking back on it, I had started there, and then dabbled other other places. Gotcha. Because I'm so used to oh man, you know this trigger feels so nice and, and right. blah blah blah, uh, like having the, the Cadillac of you know triggers on, on sure. my gun that go into a combat trigger, you know like you would experience on a Glock or a, a stock AK. Well, if, if um, you want your, your Glock trigger to feel good, you know what you do? Shoot it a you lot. You shoot it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. you actually, you shoot it a lot. No, and it, it's amazing how much better it feels after you a thousand rounds. And so that's what I've been to, doing too, like, along with you, like getting used to the AKs and stuff like that. It's, it's like I, I've forced myself to sit down with a stock <clears> 19 <throat> and just shoot it a lot. And, it, you know, the thing is, like, if you can shoot a Glock well, you can shoot anything well. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and that kind of brings up another point of repetitions and practice and, and perfecting your craft. And, you know, I, I think we can kind of segue that into, into music because that's not something you just fall into. Like, you have to spend hours and hours and hours. Everyone wants to be a rock star. Right, but no one, very few really want to put in the time and work. Yeah. You know, so so for me, like, as an athlete, I, I would say it's probably similar on timeline of the amount of time you have to practice. So, you 10, know. 10,000 hours? So, yeah, I mean, it's it, it's it's a ridiculous amount that you have to pour in to perfecting that. So, I mean, for you, what, what was that experience like? Yeah, you know, and even knowing the right things to work on. That, because yeah. everyone wants to practice what they're already good at. I just want to play Wonderwall, bro. Exactly. All I need to do <laughs> is play, is oh, play you're, Wonderwall. You're by so Oasis. wrong. You're so wrong in so many ways. I play Wonderwall, I get the chick. That's all you need, right? <laughs> See, he knows. Uh, he so knows. Wrong. Acoustic so wrong guitar, Wonderwall, that, man, and, and the panties drop. It's nice. <laughs> That's the secret. I'm we can cut that out, right? We <laughs> give it post. Yeah. I'm actually really gl glad that you brought that up because there are a lot of great parallels between uh, the firearms world and you know what I do in the music industry. So um, what I can equate it to, when you go to an indoor range mm -hmm. and the scenario is perfect, everything's good, you've got your glasses and your ears on just right, you, you know, I can... Push your sleeves up and you hike your pants up and whatever your your gun sitting out here with your magazines, your paper targets right in front of you, and you can take your time and you know breathe right, and slowly go out, pop them off, and you're going for those bullseyes, right? Mm -hmm. You're going for good tight groups, and slow pace, whatever it is. Um, so many people get comfortable doing that, and then that's all that they want to do is they want to shoot bullseyes. Yep. Right? But that's yep. not that's not fighting with a pistol. Right. So similarly, if you get a guitar and you're sitting down in your bedroom and you've got your fluffy pillows around you and you've got your 
awesome headphones on <clears throat> and you're ripping and you're doing scales, right? So scales are like your fundamentals mm -hmm. on guitar. And you can learn all the scales that you want, but that doesn't mean you know how to play a song. Sure. Similarly with firearms. You get good at shooting bullseyes and you're working on fundamentals, front sight, trigger squeeze, all these things, breathing, technique, what your grip is. Um, you can get really good at that, but until you learn how to apply that to you know a real life scenario, same like in the music world, until you know how to apply and use a scale properly in mm -hmm. a song, well, it's, it doesn't mean anything. And then I think that would take another step, right? To where it's like, okay, I, I know the fundamentals, and now I know how to play a song. Right. But okay, then, now play it live. Now play it in front yes. of somebody. Right. Yeah. You yeah. know, and that's, exactly. that's just taking that next well, step. It's like punching stress. a bag versus punching a person. Sure. You know, yeah. punching a bag, punching mitts, and getting in and having another human there. Mm -hmm. You're like, wow, it was way easier to just punch a bag. Oh, so much easier. The bag didn't, want, no, to, the bag well, didn't want to punch me back. You know, I think what people d discount is the is the nerves, right? Mm. Where you can spar, so you get to the point where, hey, I can go against another live person, right? That's not a big deal. Again, it's a controlled environment. I know this guy. I've trained with him. I have an idea of what he's going to do, so I'm pretty comfortable, right? And I know he's not going to kill me. And then you escalate that into, okay, now this is a live fight with someone who's trying to take your head off you for money, line. for reputation. Something's on the, yeah, line. on the line. There's a crowd of people, all these factors. And now, okay, perform and do it. And that's a whole nother level. And, and you know, for, for me, I, I've, I've fought in fairly large venues, but probably nowhere close to, you know, what you guys have, have played it with Pop Evil. But there, there is still a level of, man, that, that factors in quite a bit, I think. Of course it does. Yeah, and it's great. And the, the best way to get better at that is to do it more. You have to, yep. You know, so There's no secret. You just have to... You go from learning scales to playing songs to playing them live and then experiencing things not going the way that you plan and, and getting to that point where you're comfortable <clears> enough and you've got the hours in yep. to where if something gets fouled, you know how to fix it right away. You can jump back into it. You can account for it. I, my guitar is a little out of tune. <laughs> I can transpose are it. You, are you going where I'm going with this? Well, no, well actually, what I'm thinking, and I, maybe not, but what we're all talking about right now, firearms are real, mm -hmm. genuine, actual action. Music you're producing it, you're actually doing something physical to produce it, fighting and training and so forth. What we're, we're dealing with physicality in the artificial world. How many 16, 17, 18 year olds have almost no idea what it is to deal with a genuine physicality versus notional, the notional world, right? the app world, mm -hmm. the, you know, this, this requires, and that's the thing is, I think it's a, we're really doing a disservice to our kids, is because our kids don't understand, because of their life experience, what it means to achieve in any of the physical realms that we're talking about. Whether it's using firearms, or playing an instrument, or, or you know martial arts training, or whatever, because that's a physical realm that requires both your physical and mental dedication. And... What we're raising our kids is we're raising them in this artificial world. So if you're a parent, <laughs> listen to me, you freaks. If you're parents and you want to get your kid out of the artificial world, get them into the martial arts, make them learn to play an instrument or encourage them to play an instrument. Not, not, a, not an iPhone, an actual real instrument, or make them go out on the range. You know, that's well, all of the above. The, or Yeah. Or the I great mean, thing about, like, <clears throat> for instance, the shooting sports is the, the arrow doesn't care about your feeling or your gender choices <laughs> or whether mommy said you're a beautiful you know, little snowflake. If you don't do what you're supposed to do, the arrow's not going to hit the target. It doesn't yeah. go where it's supposed it, to go. You know, that orange, the orange thing that's flying across the sky, if you don't apply yourself mentally and physically, it's not going to break. The target doesn't care anything about your feelings. So, and the, you know, you, you can feel like you're the most special snowflake and I hand your guitar and say, where's the app? You know, like, where's... <laughs> You know, where, where, is there an iPhone app? How do I make? What do I push? Is there a push to make it do? Yeah. Not, can I enter can I, a cheat code? I, I wore my skinny jeans. Isn't I wore this my skinny to work? jeans. <laughs> How? Why is this? Was there a cheat code for this guitar or whatever? There's no cheat code for for you know for the ring. Right. Uh, and I think what we're talking about, like underline, is discipline. You know, it, and it's one of those. And things how do you learn it? You don't learn it overnight. You, you right. progressively. It takes learn years it. Well, and, and years and years. And the other thing is, you have to have consequence. You know, we in in this artificial world. 
there's very little consequence for anything that you do. For example, if you're going to get on the internet and you know be a keyboard warrior, for example, you know just as was one instance, no consequence, right? You could say whatever you want to. The likely any kind of blowback is relatively small. Yeah, That's not going to have a huge impact, right? You would never do that in real life. You know what I mean? Face to face to someone. Same thing, consequence of training your craft, right? If you're not putting the hours in practicing and now you get on stage and you're fumbling around, you look like an asshat, people don't come to your concerts anymore, right? right? There's consequences and, and you I know, think, we, we're we eliminating that and that's a problem. And people are quick to give up too, you know what I mean? Yeah, it's, yeah. yeah. When they I, find I didn't something succeed that they're today, not so. good at, so, I'm done. they're like, ah, it's not for me. I'm good at, I'm good at video games. Yeah. I'll be honest, that, I... You know, I hate doing things that I'm not good at. Yeah. I really do. I, I I will say I will go out of my way to avoid not making an ass out of myself doing something that I don't know how to do. But it's human nature. It is human. Yeah, we do, we want to do that. But I know it's somewhere in the back of my head. There's there's someone that's like, nope, bro, you got to step in there. You got to do it, even if you look like an idiot. Go for it. Um, and we have to listen to that voice. And you know the the other side of that is being responsible for seeing someone coming up in mm. martial arts, seeing musicians coming up, seeing people coming up in the gun world who may be timid about it and making an environment where they can feel empowered, yeah. where they're not afraid to make mistakes and you can let them know that it's all right. You know, you have to start somewhere. Everyone has to start somewhere, but there should be encouragement. And I think, you know, Dude, in the firearms world, I see it all the time. Like, a guy will bring his wife to the range. She doesn't want to be there. He doesn't know how to coach her properly. And they have a That's terrible the experience. That's the surest way to do a divorce is to try and teach your wife anything. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. But, and, you know, without having a good sense of community and welcoming people into that community and, you know, taking out the gentleman <clears throat> side of it, which yeah. is, you know, I've gotten to where I am because I had great people around me. Now it's my turn to be a good person to other people and help yeah. lift them up. And well, bring it's them a up. cycle of mentorship, and that's what we really need. Mm -hmm. And whatever arena that we're in, you know, I've had some fantastic mentors that that helped that brought me up. I had great coaches, and and you get to a certain point, at least you should, as a mature adult, where you realize you're like, okay, so you're that mentor, I, it's time for me to pay back that mentor. It's time for me to step up and do what that guy did for me. You know, I, I had some really good instructors, and I decided when I became an instructor, I'm like, I remember those guys that I was just like a, a goofy, you know, moron, and, and but they still helped me. They gave me those nuggets that I needed. So now it's my turn to give those people yeah. that. And, and, you know, I, I don't know how it is in the in the music industry, but but I know for the, the firearms industry and, and in the martial arts uh, as well, people can be ruthless, one, right, in, in critiquing. Like, they're always looking for someone to, to mess up so they can, you know, highlight that. And then the other thing is we, for some reason, everyone just inherently thinks that as a male, you can shoot a firearm. Oh. <laughs> as a guy, you can throw a punch and fist fight. Mm -hmm. There's like, ego what? wrapped up. Yeah, there, there's so oh, much yeah. ego in those two things. And again, I don't, you know, I don't know how much of that occurs in, in music, but it's like, what makes you think that is you're going to... there gonna... an ego in, in your business? No way. And show no. Do <laughs> you ever experience encounter ego in, in your day to day? <laughs> it, it goes one of two ways. Like the more success you have, either it feeds your ego or it diminishes it. It either inflates you to where you think that you're untouchable, or you go in the opposite direction and try to humble yourself. You learn some humility. Um, well, but but the, and the thing is, the way I look at it is, so someone new, brand new, comes in, right? And in their mind, they're thinking, yeah, dude, I, you know, I'm pretty strong. I'm well-built. You know, I lifted some weights, and, you know, my dad showed me a couple moves, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be a great fighter. And it's like, w why? What? No, that's not how that works, you know? If you're day what? one brand new and you just show up, no one expects you to be awesome. And these guys will get really butthurt because they're getting their ass kicked. It's like, well, yeah, of course, you're, you're brand new. It's like, you know, if I pick up a guitar, it's going to sound horrible. And I'm like, man, I'm fucking terrible at this. And you're like, well, yeah, of course you are. You've never done it before. Right. Same thing with shooting a gun, you know. Well, I was born with testicles, so I can shoot. Oh. I can drive. I can shoot. Maybe mine just aren't I big enough. Make, you know, and that's my problem. Men, men think that because they were born with testicles, they can do three things. They're good drivers, good lovers, and good shooters. And I'll have four good fighters. It, that's it, that's it's, kind it's of It's all like, a lie. It's all a lie. Yeah. 
you know, I think something else that feeds into that, into that too is, uh, you know, being in the technology age that we are and social media and all that kind of stuff, people from behind the screen only see people doing things yeah. perfect. You yep. know? Yeah. A lot of the people that you focus on and, and that you see from day to day, uh, you know, the, the guys with the most followers and this and that and the people that you look up to, they're mainly showing things that they are great at. So you expect to go out and be awesome at it too. It's a highlight reel. Yeah, and, because... And also, because when, when you don't do something great and say you share it with the world, you've got so many people that don't care that are quick to bash you and, and make you feel like you should tuck your tail between your legs and run nope. the other way. With, with, with the success, everyone sees the success. No one sees the effort that went up to achieving the success. Right. Everyone just sees the success. They're like, oh, man, it, that, that must be easy because you made it. He's like, dude, you don't have no idea yeah. what, ha what and, we had to do to get to this point. And the other thing, too, is you know what, what I've noticed is some of the most successful people, you don't really see the process because they're too busy working, right? You know, if, if you have time to sit there and then like, hey, look how cool I am, like every 10 minutes, you can't really be working that Dude, hard. You know, there's very few people that, that, you know, so it's either when you have to understand that, that veil, right? It's like, well, maybe a lot of this is for show. Maybe there's a little bit of, you know, hokum going on here that eh, it's not all it's cracked up to be. Right. Hey, we got guests. Yeah. Oh. Hopefully this isn't a secret, but if it is, <laughs> yeah, you can hear it from me. Right. <laughs> the cameras. I mean, so, yeah. But, um, so they're doing a movie, Operation Underground Railroad does uh, operations worldwide. Have you heard of them? Yeah, it's a, so the for, human trafficking. For human trafficking, specifically for kids that are getting sold into prostitution rings and stuff. And so they do sting operations where they'll go over and help um, put these guys in jail and then they'll rescue the kids. And then they also are really good. They'll do a bunch of uh, aftercare programs to help keep the kids from falling back in or getting, you know, whatever. And so anyways, they're doing a movie, the founder, Tim Ballard, who's actually done uh, several uh, lives with us. The founder, they're doing a movie about him and about Operation Underground Railroad. And um, Jim Caviezel is going to play Tim. Ah, uh, so you were training him up to actually... Yeah, I mean, we weren't training. I was there, I was going to help, and then they were so late, and I had to get back here. And so we sat, and Wally and I chatted with him for a little while. Super yeah. nice guy. Nice. Really, really, really a good American, very supportive of, you know, veterans and the cause. And, and nice and friendly. Actually, good conversation. Awesome. So, so, speak of the devil, we have Jeff Kirkham himself just just showed up, and uh, of course we have Wally Teslim. You guys have seen him before. We've had him on the Savage Gentleman Show, and just a recap: we're here with Student of the Gun. We're here with Matt Dorito of Pop Evil, and man, we're just Jeff Wally. We're just talking about um, being Savage Gentlemen, basically. So how we're long solving all the world's problems. Pretty much. Basically. That's so perfect. Gonna... The only thing we're missing is no whiskey. But oh well. Well, but he's got a concert. He's got to play tonight. He's got to play. Per perfect. You, Even you better. Get layered up beforehand, right? Okay. No. So <laughs> how long have you been in the? How long's Pop Evil been around? And... So I've been in the band for eleven years, and uh, oh wow, this so basically since the beginning, we will have been a touring entity for ten years this August. No kidding. Uh, so yeah, in August, 10 years ago, I got to quit my day job being a shop rat, welding and die setting and all that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's been a, it's been a pretty wild ride, you know. That's why you're it, so good at working on motorcycles, because you used to work in a shop. Yeah, I, I have to have something hands on, like I have to have some kind of project all the time to come back to at home. You know, that's that's my therapy when the, I get off the road. And you're the bassist, right? Yes. So there's a good friend of mine that was the uh, he was oh, the original yeah. bassist yeah. for Nirvana. Oh, oh really? Jason Everman. Really? Yeah, Jason and I were we met in uh, special forces and then and then we we're in the CT unit together working in Afghanistan. And Jason was actually the best man at my wedding when when uh, my wife and I got married. Oh, yeah, that's he's, awesome, he's, man. Yeah, he's a good buddy of ours. Yeah, that's great. Does he live in the area, or is he no, still in, like, no. Seattle? No, he lives up in the Seattle area. Yeah, okay. trying to get trying to get him out of the North Wet is uh, almost impossible. So. Yeah, those guys love it up there, man. Yeah. Our last record we did with uh, a producer that worked with them in the early days and stuff, um, he did, like, all the grunge bands. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, he was with Nirvana, and then he was with Soundgarden. 
and then he did uh, Mind Funk, which okay. I think was more of a New York band. But um, mind funk for a while, and then he, you know, by then he was already doing military stuff, and he's a fascinating guy to talk to. He's got his, uh, got his degree, just finished his degree a couple of years ago from Columbia University in philosophy, and I mean, he's he like a, he is like the quintessential warrior poet. Like, yeah, he is. Like that is one hundred percent. He's he is without a doubt the most well-read person I've ever met. I mean, he's he's read a library worth of books and then some. And, yeah, he's just, he's a great dude. So That's awesome. Yeah. Last time we saw him in Vegas, in Germany? Yeah. In SHOT Show. Yeah. At SHOT Show, yeah. He came and saw us at SHOT Show. Yeah. He's a good guy. Yeah. Really good guy. I don't That's know awesome. if you ever, was a, if you ever, you ever run into him and you're, he still plays once in a while, like pop-up stuff, but. Um, it's a very small world, like yeah. in the music industry, much like the firearms industry, any industry. Uh, but I, I've yet to cross paths with him. Uh, so. Well, if you do, you tell him I said hi. Awesome. He's great. It's funny. It's like I'll send him an email, but then the answer to my email actually goes to my wife's email. And she'll be like, oh, you must have emailed Jason because he answered your email. <laughs> <laughs> on this thing. That's funny. Go figure. So, yeah. yeah. Well, cool. And then what you, so how long are you guys going to keep jamming? Well, uh, we just started this tour. It's a six-week tour with Poison and Cheap Trick. Oh. And then, uh, I mean, Cheap Trick's still playing. Yeah, Whoa. yeah. Original, he's Rick original Davis lineup. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, all but all but one guy. Like some serious constitution. Guitar, yeah, definitely. It, they're tearing it up every night, man. They're and those guys crazy. were those guys were like Getting after it. a little bit older when I was. <laughs> yeah, I saw them. I remember what, like in '79 when they came to the Pontiac Silverdome. Yeah. In, in Michigan. Yeah, Cheap Trick was a <laughs> '70s band. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. With the Budokan album was like 77 or 78 or something like that. Live at their big one, live at Cheap Trick Live at Budokan. Yeah. I want you to want me. <laughs> yeah, that's the song. Yeah, yeah they always play yeah. the live version too. Yeah, um, yeah you know, uh, we'll stay busy. Like, our only downtime is usually when we're making an album. And uh, we just released one in February, so we'll be out you know, the rest of this year. And, and where Michigan. do you guys live? Michigan. Michigan. Midwest okay. Boys. Nice. Yeah, while well, he was asking me. Yeah. So I was like, Detroit, Mississippi. Something with them. <laughs> One of those M states. Definitely M state. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's about right there. Right here, actually. Right. Good. Oh, yeah. On yeah, the right, hand. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, there you go. Skull and crossbones marks the spot. Nice. That's so cool. We use for a map. But yeah, so I do uh, I do band. I do. I have a charity called Star Treatments that we talked a little bit about here. What is it? Uh, Star Treatments. What's that? So it's uh, it's transportation company that we work with sick kids with a, you know, cancer, leukemia, autoimmune disease, any any sick children, we provide them like a VIP transportation back and forth to the hospital oh, to get wow, their treatments done cool. or checkups or surgeries, anything that they need. So we'll send them off in like limos, party buses, um, we've done like first class flights before, tour buses like ones we travel in, um, and send them off with an experience, you know. Wow, that's very cool. Yeah, that's very cool that um work with cat the guns a little bit oh those yeah dudes. that's pretty cool so where do you where do they are they based out of michigan as well they're based out of uh pennsylvania so okay their main facility they have another one in fort wayne indiana and i linked up with those guys years back in sturgis and um i've just been getting more and more involved with the company uh like i'll, I'll go and rep with them at shot show and stuff like that nice so anytime I'm, I'm free i'm out working with those guys and uh, I kind of tie that back into like the charity and the band thing and stuff too. So when I'm on the road, I'll do meet and greets during the day where if people make a donation to my charity, I'll meet them at a local gun range before the show. We'll go shoot together, you know, get to shoot you know, some of the cabins and things like that. Like Fioki sponsors it so they don't have to pay for ammunition. <coughs> they don't have to pay for rentals or anything like that. Oh, wow. Show up that's a good, that's a pretty go sweet gig. Range. I know, next what are we time, doing? Next time we'll go to the range. I, I blame I blame Paul, that was his fault. <laughs> you set this man. up. What the hell? Well, I'm coming to town and you think I don't want to shoot guns? Is that, uh, is that the God. thing? Uh, how often do you get to come to Black Rifle Coffee? Yeah, I okay. know, that's awesome. Mm. I always visit the booth in Sturgis. Play Buffalo Chip every year. What's Buffalo Chip? That's where uh, the Black yeah. Rifle sets up right yeah. by there. Oh, uh, yeah. Leave. By the campgrounds and stuff. So uh, okay. you can go shoot machine guns and off, you know, um. off the little highway there. It's just a, a huge stage. 
It's always in August. I think. Like the beginning, right? The beginning of August, I yeah. think. End of July, beginning of August. We should go up there. Road trip, everyone. We're going. That's yeah. it. Boom. That's well, happening. Because Black Hills is in Rapid City. Yeah, I don't think you is that a it's is that a requirement? Do you have to show up with a motorcycle? I think you can drive, if you show up in a pickup truck, I think they'll, they'll give you okay? a nod and let you go. All right. What about my what about my minivan? <laughs> We're just gonna load up Jeff's minivan. Definitely, it's definitely, a Dodge. definitely. We're gonna take the little one out there with the blue truck nuts hanging off of it. What is that? Oh, Harry's <laughs> smart car. That's Harry's smart we'll car. We'll take the smart car with the with the truck. But we'll have Jeff it. driving it, so nobody will be like, oh, okay, carry on. <laughs> Put Jeff and Molly in. Oh, mess with <laughs> you know, we got to get this guy back in time, or he'll turn into a pumpkin. So, we, and we there's traps, so we got to make sure that we don't go too long here. Did you say He's got to sound check at three. <laughs> three. three. Get a blumpkin, get yeah, you get a pumpkin. You're getting a pumpkin. Where are you going? Uh, Usama, Usama, the amphitheater Usama. in uh, West Valley. West Valley. Uh, that'll be fast. Should be pretty quick. Cruise down here, like two or one. Oh, yeah. You gotta eat first. 215. Yeah, they gotta eat. Lucky thir yeah. Take him to Lucky 13. Yeah. Unless you hate him. No. He, uh, he knows where Lucky 13 is. He's, like some of the best burgers oh, like at yeah. Salt Lake. Lucky That's 13. Amazing. There's your there you go. Thanks, Lucky 13. Right, this podcast see. brought to you by Lucky 13. Oh, up front? Yeah. yeah. Um, the, the human trafficking thing, I, I kind of um, sparked something when you're talking about that. So Michigan is one of the, the states with the highest human trafficking. And, oh, really? Uh, yeah, and a lot of it wow. happens in like Walmarts, um, you know, like shopping centers and things like that. And I called James Yeager to tell him about this because I had an experience with a friend of mine where they attempted it. And so what they're doing now is, uh, I don't know if you've heard about this. This was the first time I heard about it. This guy dropped his uh, Apple Watch in her purse while she was shopping. To track? To track her. So they'll, they'll take like Apple earbuds or and Any kind of an eye device like that, that you can track with a phone. You can track with a phone. So he dropped it in her purse. She didn't even know it was in there. And um, she only goes out like once a week to go grocery shopping because she works from home. So she knew that's when it happened. But they'll, <laughs> they'll track it in a watch to see where it sits overnight. Show house. Wow. They'll either show up at your house or they'll watch you leave your house. You know. Huh. Well, that's the two. You figure that's the the two main times people get swooped up or kidnapped or attacked is because you have to leave your house and you have to return to your house. So rather than right. doing the spy versus spy, following people around, if you can identify, it's called pattern of life. If you can identify what their pattern of life is. Of where they live, then that's then all you have to do is set up on the house or work or work. That's what, yep. like when I worked at a hospital. Like a lot of these women with crazy ex husbands, boyfriends, or whatever, they change their phone number, they change their address, they move to but the they same still job, work at the same place, and so they know where to find them yep. because they still work at the same place. Yep. Work and, and so home. They'll go, and most people don't think that your workplace is, is prone to domestic violence. Workplaces are more prone to domestic violence almost than anything else, other than your actual house. Unless you work here at Black Rifle. College. Unless you work at Black and Rifle. And then, and then this this would be a bad place. Homie, don't play that. No. no, no, play. no, no, no. It's like you know, people are like they're like, well, you worried people come going to come to your place of business and fuck with you? I'm like, ah, <laughs> <laughs> like that would be the worst possible <laughs> thing they could do. <laughs> That's like, cool. I'm, I'm going to use that in some of my classes to, uh, yeah. we teach women and stuff. You know, every once in a while, and so like soccer moms and stuff. And so I, I hadn't heard that. No, that's. I, I mean, that's a terrifying prospect. But it, it's good yeah, to know it, that it's because it's terrifying. Yeah. My wife would never think to look. You know, I mean, she's she's pretty meticulous about her mm -hmm. stuff. But think how many girls are kind of scatterbrained and they'll leave their their big purse open over their, their arms yeah, and oh yeah. just come up behind them and drop something Wouldn't be hard at there. all. And you'd never suspect. You'd be like, what's this? You know, it, it, you wouldn't think someone would drop something expensive like De an Apple Watch yeah. in yeah. your purse on purpose or like a little set of earbuds, you know. Um, but it, it happened, Man. you know. Uh, it, you know, a lot of girls will leave their purse open or something and leave it in the shopping cart mm -hmm. and turn their back for two seconds too. So just things like that, you know, being aware of your belongings and, Wow, scary! Like Man, that. that is scary. There's a fine line between civility and savagery in our society that, thankfully, most people I don't think see. But there are animals out there. There are savages on both sides. Yes, right. Yeah. 
it's like uh, Jaeger says, he goes, you, you like riding the elevator as a cop, because most people don't really like cops. You know, in society, you have, generally people stay in their clique. So if, if you're like a crackhead and you live on the street, you hang out with crackheads on the street. And if you're an executive, you hang with executives. But police officers ride the elevator. Yeah. Between executives and housewives and crackheads up and down all day long. And so most people don't mm. ever see anything outside of their own, mm. you know, pure their, their own little paradigm. Yeah, they have their they have their mirror world and, and that's what they see, but they don't realize there are other things. That's why it's so difficult to convince people to protect themselves or whatever, because they think they're like, I'm a good person and I would never do that. I can't even fathom <clears throat> I can't even wrap my mind around someone doing that. Like, yeah, but they don't think like you. Yeah, because they're not you. And it, well, it's they're that same, not you. It's and that same normalcy bias. Exactly. Too. Like, well, it's that like, never happens. I've yeah, never like, seen it. Yeah. I don't know anyone that that's happened to. So it's like that, it couldn't that, happen. It never happens until it does. Right. I've never had a tornado blow my house over either. Yeah. But you know that that a is a thing. Sometimes it happens. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Especially it, if you're in a trailer. Yeah. It's yeah, like yeah, tornado like magnets. magnets. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Man. Um, you know, at the same token, a lot of those people, when you talk about, you know, protecting themselves, defending themselves, their family, their home, uh, they'll respond with, well, I would never want to, like, hurt kill someone. someone or I would never want to hurt someone. You know, just, just enough like, to stop them. But, like, can you show me how someone to wants to hurt you. defend myself enough you just know, to stop them? It, and it's, 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 it's harsh, but you know, it, it goes all the way back. I don't know if you heard it when you were with SF, but I heard it when I was in Marine Corps. I, I don't remember the instructor that said it because but right now someone in this world is training to kill you. Yep. You you can't see them and you don't know where they are, but that's a fact. Mm -hmm. And so when we go out and train, we're gonna train harder. So when we meet that person, we will be able to destroy them. That's that Ed, do you ever see that poster for uh, prison guards? And it's this big massive dude doing squats. Yeah. And it and it says, you know, and he's and it back of his shirt says a uh, prisoner on it and the caption says he hasn't missed a training day have you <laughs> Ooh. yeah yeah it's all they have time to do it's all they have time yeah. to do so but but it's that mentality it's you know and i try and convince you the thing is how do you do that how do you convince someone who's in that comfortable zone that they're actually monsters well, but you have to make there are monsters but, but you know you know what you call a democrat who's been mugged what's that a republican a Republican. You know what you call a Republican who's been through the legal system? What? A Libertarian. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and, and going back to that, you know, I, I would say the best way to take someone and get it through their head who has been very comfortable is you have to make them uncomfortable. You have to put them in an environment yeah. where they are uncomfortable. You have to push them through so that they can experience like... Oh wait, the world isn't sunshine and roses and, and everything, right? Yeah, that's why like, we say, like you know, we bring up reality, like you know, I well, I I only carry my gun when I think I'll need it. Well, when is that, man? You what's know? what crystal ball do yeah, you have? Like, when is that? Did you know? know. I need you that know course. We had a thing near us where uh, eleven o'clock in the morning on a Wednesday, uh, Win Dixie, grocery store, mm -hmm. ex husband looking for his his ex wife. Doesn't know where she lives, doesn't know her phone number, knows she works at Win Dixie. Walks in with a shotgun and a pistol, starts taking people hostage. And and I say, how many of you, like, I won't carry, you won't carry your gun because I'm just going grocery shopping. Yeah. It, it's Wednesday morning at 11 o'clock. Nothing bad's going to happen to me at a grocery store. You're paranoid because you think you should always have a gun. I'm like, really? Because that guy walked in at 11 o'clock on a Wednesday morning started taking hostages. <clears throat> and it has nothing to do with you. Or whether or not you're a good person yeah. or a nice person, you, it's just because you're there. Yep. yep. You know, when you're standing in, in a quickie mart and you're like, "I'm a good person," but do you know that that the clerk's crazy ex-husband isn't going to walk in and like, "I found you, bitch," you know? And there you are, <laughs> stuck in the middle. You're there, and you're yeah. like, "Hang on," you know, but I'm a good person. Let me well, explain. To and you. you know that that brings up a great point. You know, with Ready Man, we talk about there's a very fine line between being prepared and paranoid, right? Mm -hmm. Dude, I say that all the time. Yeah, you know, to where. Yeah, the, you could take it too extreme, but probably not. I mean, if yeah, probably it, not it probably isn't. I mean, you know, if you're we, carrying we, six nineteen eleven magazines, may, probably too yeah. much. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, you don't have. We can take the tinfoil hat off. We can leave <laughs> that in the car. But anything short of that is like, yeah, you're not outside the realm of possible things that could happen. I mean, I look at a lot of things like, you know, 
as law enforcement, like what does the law enforcement look as as like a reasonable amount to carry with them to be ready for any situation mm -hmm. that they might encounter? I don't think it's unreasonable for any civilian to take those same measures. You should have the, 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 the four minimums, <laughs> lethal, sharp, medical, and, and bright. Oh, I like that. That'd be a good t-shirt. Lethal, sharp, bright, medical. I know it's not, and I was trying to come up with a different thing for medical, but I just... What about, what about blunt? Blunt. Can we put blunt in there? <laughs> What's <laughs> lethal with you? <laughs> lethal, sharp, <laughs> lethal. Right. Minimums, not maximums. I didn't say maximums. I said Is that overkill? Minimums. Is that too far? Yeah. Okay. I mean, you, you can do whatever you want. You, can, like, yeah. get a backpack. you would actually be you safer. You get an RPG and with a backpack. So you might as well. No, you would, I'm just you saying... Would, Minimums. Yeah, you'd be safer if I had a firearm than if I didn't, honestly. Exactly. Yeah. Like, I'm, I'm far more dangerous without one than I am with one. <laughs> All right, you heard it directly from Josh's mouth, directly from Matt's mouth, and directly from mine. And you're going to support Star Treatments by going to startreatments.org or the charity hack, smile.amazon.com.